So, I, hi, I'm Pete, um, and this is me. I do many things. Um, I like to walk, I like to hike, I like to climb, but also uh, I am a data scientist. Um, God, that was great. Anyway, um, so I guess it's a little bit unusual for a data scientist to talk about data engineering type projects. So, I was Deliveroo's first data hire about a year ago, um, and as I came into the project, came into the company, um, there was literally nothing. So, in, while the title is very much about Luigi, this is very much the story of how kind of I came in from square one and put some of that together. Um, so yeah, I work for Deliveroo. And for those of you who have not heard of us before, we're a London-based tech startup, and we do delivery. Uh, this is primarily for restaurants, so kind of like the restaurants that normally wouldn't do delivery, we provide a delivery service with an app and a website and all those kind of things. Now, I submitted this talk uh, a couple of months ago, um, and as I kind of finally got around to starting to write it about Wednesday night, um, <laughs> Uh, I, I kind of decided um, the title was quite dry and quite hard to get started. So I've actually come up with a different title. So I do apologize, but I'm changing the title to this. Why it's better to be woken up by your cat than by the server alarm. So uh, what do I mean by that? So this is my cat's kitty. Um, so let's introduce everyone to Kitty. This is Kitty, um, she's a lovely little creature. Uh, kitty is very particular in her ways. So Kitty likes to have breakfast 6 a.m. sharp. And if she does not get it, Kitty has no respect, right? She is. <laughs> She's in your face, she wants her food at 6 o'clock, where's my breakfast? This, for those of you who have not come across it, is PagerDuty. PagerDuty is an application that's very widely used by many engineering people to tell them when things break. And it has much, much less for your personal space, less respect for your personal space. So, for those of you who are not bad-mouthing PagerDuty, but basically you can connect it up to your servers. When the alarm goes off, it phones your phone, it sends you an email, it sends you a text, the light on your phone flashes, and basically your hell breaks loose until you fix it. So uh, let's compare the two. So uh, pager duty. Um, so it goes of any time. It's a nightmare, right? This thing likes to go off at 3 a.m. Sunday morning after a big Saturday night out. It's awful, right? <laughs> and it's like the loud ring, and it's like, and if, it, if you don't answer the phone, it phones your boss, and all these kind of horrible things. And when something goes wrong, it can take hours to fix, right? You're, you're dealing with some kind of problem on the server. You've got to diagnose it. You've got to fix it. You've got to patch it. You've got to ship the patch. Kitty, on the other hand, right? Kitty only goes off once a day, and it's just very predictable 6 a.m. Set your alarm for 5 to 6, and you're always good. Uh, it's a very nice kind of cute batting motion to get in your face waking you up. And usually it's solvable simply by opening some cat food. So in summary, uh, I think we can all agree with my premise. Kitty is a lot better than pager duty. So that's kind of the, the, the how I wanted to feel about this. And this is it's quite an emotive topic. It's been quite a long year. But cut to the chase, let's get to it. Let's start at the beginning. So chapter one, the model. So I first joined Deliveroo. This is kind of like summer last year, kind of end of summer last year. And the first thing um, we decided to do, let's build a model. Right, so I'm a data scientist, building models is what I do. Right? We want to build a model to make our systems better. Cool. So I'm a Python guy, I've been doing that for about 10 years now. Uh, so about six years, I've been dating for about 10. So first thing I do is, right, cool, I'll open, I'll open a Python file. I'll like, okay, let's import pandas. Let's like, you know, get ready to connect to a database, get the data in, get it in a data frame, and I can start modeling. Um, but where's the data? Right? Um, so in Deliveroo, we have, when, I, when I joined, it was still a kind of a Rails monolith. Right? So we have a thick application layer in Rails, and then a single Postgres production database supporting everything else. So how do I get that data? Hey, man, just, uh, just PG dump the, da the pod database. That's going to be totally fine. <laughs> I can spot the data engineers in the room from that noise. <laughs> um, this, this is kind of my reaction as well. I know enough about these things to know that's, that's a bad idea, right? especially to try and do that with any kind of repetition. That's bad. right? So I knew enough to say, actually, let's try and do this a bit more sensibly. right? So I span up a read slave. So this is for those who po use Postgres. You can have like a secondary kind of streamed version that you can just read data from without actually hitting the production database. So we can set that up, ETL the data from that database to somewhere where I can work with it. It's like a warehouse, something like that. Um, and then from there, I can actually start to train some models. So I can actually start to do some science. Right. So I want to load data. I want to do some transformations. And I want to actually then do some models on top of it. Now, in the beginning kind of thing, there was cron, right? You set up cron, you do a job, something happens, and it's done. The problem is, if you've got two jobs, or three jobs, or four jobs, how do you know the first job's finished before the second job, before the third job, before the fourth job? Um, so how do we know, how do we ensure those tasks are going to run in order? Because if they don't, things are going to be wrong. So exactly this. So this is, this is I'd like to introduce this idea of kind of flow charts, and everyone here has been to kind of junior school, so I'm sure this is a very familiar idea. Um, but what we're saying is I want 1, 2, and 3 to run before 4. I want 4 to run before 5, 6, and 7. And I want 5, 6, and 7 to run before 8. And I don't want anything to propagate until the, all the things before we're finished. Right? I'm basically creating dependencies for kind of my tasks. 
Um, the fancy word for this is a directed acyclic graph, um, which means it's like a, a, a network shape. Um, directed means it goes in a direction along that network, so the links have direction. Um, and it's acyclic, so it can't loop back on itself. Um, so I will now refer to these as DAGs. Um, and apparently this is really funny. I don't know, the test group loved this. Um, <laughs> so I'm not talking about dogs, I'm talking about DAGs. So, okay. so how do we do this? Enter stage left, Luigi. So, uh, as Marco very well points out earlier, uh, Marco, are you in the room, Marco? Wait for me if you're here. No? Okay, cool. Um, <laughs> all this stuff was wrong, my stuff's right. If, he, if anyone questions, it's fine. Um, so it's a library that Spotify put together kind of about two, three years ago, I think. Um, and they were very interested in uh, batch compute, mainly on Hadoop, actually. And they're doing a lot of MapReduce type stuff. But really, kind of, we, we saw this and thought, actually, we're not doing MapReduce. We weren't working with particularly big data. We're talking kind of tens of millions of rows, nothing more than that. So actually, we want something just to manage the dependencies. But this looked kind of like a cool way to do it. Um, here's some syntax. Uh, for the, I'll kind of do this briefly because I know some of you saw this already. Um, but effectively, what you do is you import Luigi, you uh, extend the, the task class, and then you define three methods. So it requires, so you actually bake your dependencies into your tasks, right? So this is one task, and I say this task, before it can happen, this other, some other task has to have happened first, right? I then do the meet. So I go, right, I'm going to run some stuff. Um, so I'm going to you know, take some kind of class that I've created. I'm going to instantiate it, do some stuff, and then write some output. In this case, I'm ba basically writing log files, right? And then finally, I say my output. This is where the log file is. And this is really important with Luigi, because the existence of this log file with the parameter stamps and this contents tells the next task it's finished. That's how the next one knows this is done. So that's super important. Uh, Luigi also provides a number of other really cool tasks, which I immediately jumped on, because I want to move stuff from one database to another. Um, so they have this thing called the Luigi Postgres copy to table, which is an even simpler type of Luigi task, right? And in fact, you only need two methods in this class. You need the requires, again, so what tasks do I depend on um, in order to be able to do this stuff? And then you need a method called rows. So you're just, you're just overri overriding a method from the, the base class, and it has to return a tuple of tuples. But as long as you return a tuple of tuples, it's cool, right? It can run whatever you like in here. It brings back the tuple of tuples, and it will try and load it into your database using the, in the class parameters you specify, right? So you give it your host, you use all this kind of good stuff, and then you define the schema for the, the table. And if the table doesn't exist, it'll create it. If it does, it'll just add it. Cool. So that's how kind of Luigi basically works. And we can then string these together to create our DAGs. So for example, I want to load two tables, but I only want to load kind of new stuff from a certain like, row count or something. Um, so I can check the, the max row ID I want to do, make sure I have that information ready to go, and it's, it's up to date. I then load my data, and then I say, right, I need both these bits of data to have loaded, and then I can do some kind of modification, maybe an aggregation, maybe a roll-up, um, and then I can make my model. Right? So in summary, DAGs solve that dependency problem. It's a solved problem, and I learned this last year, but it's great, and it's solved, and it's lovely. So we write this code. Um, so nice Luigi. It's all written just in vanilla Python. Um, it's actually 2.7. I'm really sorry. It's not Python 3, but um, if Ian was here, he'd shout at me, but it's fine. Uh, and to make this fly, we bung it on EC2. Right? So really, really stupid simple. We have our production database, our read-only slave, which is the replica I talked about. We have a Luigi pipeline running on EC2 that's pulling from the read slave, dumping into an analytics database, and then surfacing that to services, effectively. So I've got SQL access direct to the database. I can use my PsychOp G2 library in Python to actually read stuff and do stuff with it. Um, and I can use, we actually use something called Periscope, which is our BI tool, which kind of you basically type in SQL and it gives you charts. So to make it work, now we've got it all on machine. It's not enough just to write the task. I need to tell Luigi to actually do. Um, so I do this by, firstly, I write uh, an entry point. So effectively, when you run Luigi, you only hand it one task. Right? You say, th do this task. And it will then take that task. And then effectively, it will look through the entire kind of namespace, find all the tasks that it depends on, and their dependencies, and their dependencies, construct that DAG in memory, and execute it. So effectively, I just create this one task using the wrapper task method, which is the simplest of the lot. It doesn't run anything. It doesn't output anything. All it does is say, do these requires task. So it's a really nice way of creating an entry point. And then I run uh, a scheduler. So Luigi, as well as being a Python library, comes with a kind of a binary that will effectively uh, run Luigi services for you and make sure things are running in parallel. Um, you launch it really simply. So just run Luigi D in the background, set where you want the PID file to be and the log directory, and then it's off. Uh, so that gives us now a scheduler. We have code base that describes our DAG, and we have uh, effectively classes that say what we want to actually do inside each of those tasks. The final thing we need to do is actually kick this thing off. So a quick shell script um, helps us out here. So OK, so just get in the right directory, clone the repository down, 
um, and then uh, basically fire. So you just run Python, and then whatever Python file you have your entry point in, um, as long as it's able to import all the other tasks, they can be kind of in packages beneath it. Um, you give it the name of the task you want to run, and then tell it how many workers you want it to execute with. So it'll spin up this many Python processes and then attempt to run things in parallel. You can go really crazy high with this. Um, basically, having more workers than you have CPUs seems not to be a very good idea. But anyway, so we have this shell script. And then finish it all off, we write a simple cron tab line. So at 4.31 AM, please execute this shell script and drop any errors out to this log file. Easy. And we're done. Uh, so with, this was what really drew me to Luigi and why we kind of stuck with it for as long as we have. In, because we were able to get started in hours. Right? This was kind of like my second day. I was getting data into a warehouse, and I could build models. Fantastic. So there we go. Got to a point now we can actually start to do data science. Chapter two, nuclear option. So um, all looking great. I have my data. I'm doing my job. A few weeks later, something happened. Uh, I had to Google this. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> So it turns out databases change, right? Um, I guess I kind of knew this, right? Um, so obviously at the time and even today, Deliveroo is still quite a young company. We're actually still making a lot of changes to our platform, adding a lot of features, um, which means that the schema of the underlying databases changes frequently, pretty much daily, right, um, at this point. So the, um, kind of had this interesting conversation with the, the kind of the head of engineering about this, saying, we're not prepared to give up the right to change, right? Being agile is important to us, and we're going to continue to change, and it's your job to deal with it. Thanks, bro. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so the schema can change at any time without warning. So how do we deal with this, right? As a, as a, a data scientist who set up a pipeline that I don't want to think about, I just want it to work, right? So, OK, so straight up, has the schema changed? There's a table in the database that says, has a Rails migration been applied today? Look at that table. Uh, if no migration's been applied, just add the rows. What rows are new from yesterday? Add them to the database. If the schema has changed, uh, drop cascade schema on the whole database. Drop everything. Remember, they were talking about you know, tens of millions of rows kind of thing. We can load this stuff in about 30 minutes. So drop the whole thing, reload all the tables. Easy. Um, or I, I can't put it quite as well as this, so I'll let Ripley take it. Uh, <laughs> this, uh, this kind of affectionately, this became known as the nuke job, um, in that when things change, we just nuke the database and start again. Yeah, there's many data people in the background going, ah, but anyway. Um, <laughs> so what this allowed us to do, this meant we can handle schema changes, right? This, this simple pipeline that's there to provision for a data scientist. It's working. It's happy. I'm cool. Um, we decided to add some tests. I decided to add some testing in um, because, hey, testing's cool. Um, so how did I do that? So actually what I did was I used, uh, there's something called the Luigi parameters, but it's allowed us to say, let's create operating modes for Luigi. So I actually ended up adding two operating modes, a test mode, which effectively says, for when I'm running the pipeline, run the pipeline exactly as it is, but onto a different, but don't write to the same database, right? Deal with a different database or a different schema, and that way you can actually replicate the entire thing, but you're kind of fine. We also said, I also put in a unit mode. So this is saying, if I, yes, all of my tasks are running quite well contained in unit tested code, but how do I check a task in, in its independence that it's going to run? How can I debug tasks like that? So I added a, a unit mode, which basically said, don't use the uh, requirements. And you can configure all these using a really, really cool thing called the Luigi parameter. So Luigi tasks have a signature based on the parameters that you pass to them. And so you pass Luigi tasks a, uh, an instance of a Luigi parameter, and that signature then defines the item potency of that task. Has this task run? Right. So you'll say, this task has a date. This task has uh, a table name that it's doing. It has a, an infrastructure it's working on. And you can say, right, is it a test mode? If it's test mode, um, change all of the output where you're pointing the outputs. And if it's a unit mode, just run the task that you've been asked to run. This meant that we now have like, you know, a relatively testable pipeline, which is great because it means that now nothing will ever go wrong ever again. <laughs> yeah. I think some of you can kind of see what the next bit's going to be about. But anyway, um, so make your testing comprehensive, right? Uh, it's super important. It's so easy not to do this at the beginning, but you just end up coming and having to do it later. It's also really important to make your testing fast. Um, so while we're testing a whole pipeline here, you can find there are some bits where you can use mocking and like um, you can kind of fake data sets that will like effectively not be as perfect a test of the whole pipeline, but they will at least tell you if the kind of the source data hasn't changed, will it kind of work okay? Finally, at this point, um, I started getting interested in other data that Deliveroo has. So we have a production database with kind of who ordered what, um, where were the drivers, all this kind of stuff. But we actually use a number of external services. So I wanted to kind of get my hand on some of this. One external service we use is called Staffmatic, and Staffmatic is a, effectively a scheduling tool. 
and we use this to schedule our drivers, right? So <laughs> who's going to work when and where? Um, so effectively, I built a class up that allowed me to fetch the data from that, uh, that data source while also taking care of things like dealing with duplicates because in this particular data source, it doesn't have the idea of rows. You're getting objects, and so you need to de-dupe kind of, uh, de based on unique identifiers. So we have this class, and then we can just instantiate this class back into our def rows that I talked about in terms of the Postgres, the Postgres task. So I instantiate my class, tell it all the things I'm interested in, so which part of the world do I want to load stuff for? Do I want to, is it a test run? Which table am I going to write to? And then I say, right, build the shifts, and then get the shifts. And that's going to return back to me that tuple of tuples that's in the correct format to load into the database. I plumb that in. Um, so again, just a slight change on earlier. I've now got kind of my staff Matic, my, my driver scheduling system. I was pulling in Google Analytics data. Um, so this is you know, who's coming on the website, how many sessions, how many conversions, that kind of stuff, um, as well as uh, some Met Office data. So I was really interested in so this is Data Point, um, which is where you get UK uh, weather data. It's awesome. If anyone's not used it, um, they actually categorize. They rather than just giving you like humidity and pressure and stuff, they they've done loads of work figuring out what are good categories of data. So they say they have like a category for like kind of slightly overcast, and that actually means something very scientific and is very well defined in terms of how the data clusters. So what did we learn here? Keep def rows super short. First time I wrote def rows, it was like kind of 80 lines of code. Um, you can't unit test that. It's awful. Um, don't do it. Write separate classes, test them as unit tests, and then import the class and just use that. Uh, something I wish I'd known when I started this, um, which I think I've thought of, um, be consistent in the design of those loading classes. Right? So anyone who uses scikit-learn, you know that all the models have a train function, a fit function, all have a predict function. Um, I didn't really think of that up front, so I ended up with a couple of classes that had like, one is get rows, one is get shifts, one is get. Actually, if you can come up with a simple design pattern and be consistent, that'll also make life easier. And you should also expect these external APIs to misbehave. Uh, oh, actually, that's not quite true. You should trust them as if they want to hurt you. Um, and anyone who's played with the Google Analytics API will know that um, sometimes there are server errors on the other end. Who knows why? It's mystical. Um, dimensions appear and disappear. It's just how it is, right? Anyway, Whew, cool. Right, I'm, I'm two months in at Deliveroo. I've got a database. I've got my core data. I've got my external data. It's relatively reliable and tested. Everything's great. I'm happy as a lamb, and I'm doing data science. Cool, right, so all of our data is now in one place. And remember, this is a startup, right? I'm the first data guy. So for the first time ever, we have a lot of data in one place. And all these ops guys go, ooh, ooh, awesome. Um, can, we, can we get some reports off that? Be, you know, just as kind of like a nice to have, it's not super critical, but if you could just do that, that would be awesome. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, so this happened. Um, those of you who don't uh, follow the kind of the startup investment press, um, we kind of got some money. Uh, which we basically used to grow. Um, so we've kind of opened, we started out just London, now kind of like all over the place, I'm sure. Many of you are annoyed by how many riders get in your way on the roads. Um, so suddenly, I, this ad hoc database that was built for kind of a single use, kind of like, you know, a low reliability, but kind of just, it, it's good enough for what I was doing. Suddenly, we've kind of ended up in this world where we've accrued tons of technical debt, like kind of almost overnight. We have all of our, kind of, actually got business critical apps being used kind of potentially around the world, um, relying on this kind of, relatively flaky thing. And then this happens. Uh, yeah, I kind of want my report. It needs to be ready at 10 a.m. seven days a week. And if it's not, I'm an unhappy cat. Um, this is kind of definitely one of my bigger learnings, is that it's very easy to kind of do something that seems very simple at the time. You know, kind of, oh, we've got it. Let's just put the reports. That'll be great. Um, and then it kind of comes to bite you in the ass later. So kind of stuff that was happening. Um, so. People are saying, right, so the report's not ready. Why is the report not ready? Oh, because, and then you say something that might as well be in Latin, and they go, uh, I don't care, I want the report. So job is very much, why, why are these things failing? Actually start from the beginning, why are things failing? Go backwards and fix stuff. So firstly, what we're having um, was upstream, I'll explain all these in a sec, but we're having problems upstream. So if a task upstream falls over that I don't care about, it can still stop things I do care about happening. I can also have stuff failing that I kind of care about, but I don't care about as much. Um, and then finally, I can have um, just straight up data that's very flaky. So in terms of these upstream failures, let's think about this kind of simple DAG. So I've got my start. I load a bunch of stuff. Um, I, I finish my load. I make a bunch of stuff, and I finish. Now, this design paradigm for building DAGs was kind of, it felt very intuitive and kind of elegant, um, which is why I did it. Um, so the idea of, OK, load all the stuff, confirm everything's loaded, make loads of stuff. So it's kind of like going out, come back in, go out, come back in. So you've got these kind of like checkpoints. It felt really, really kind of like a simple and nice way of doing it. Um, the problem was that this kind of thing would happen. So loads one and two would work, would load, and that would all be cool, but load three fails. And because load three fails, load done says, 
they're not all done, mate. So actually, I'm going to stop. I'm not going to proceed. I'm going to say enough. And that means none of these folks happen either. So what's happening is this might, so say this is the management report, and this is the data I need for the management report, but the management report's not happening, even though the stuff that I need is kind of done. So this means my DAG is broken. So yeah, so exactly this, right? So this one doesn't need, lo no, need load three, so we change the DAG. So we remove the dependency from make one onto load all, and just load, just change the shape of the DAG. This now means that when load three fails, boom, awesome. I have basically managed to segregate out parts of my DAG such that the things I really care about, I've been very, very clear, these are the minimum things that need to happen to make that happen. I made it just depend on that. And what we've done here is we've decided, basically we're making decisions about what can be, what do we not mind failing that much, um, and what things do we really care about. And we've done that by isolating uh, the critical ops jobs. Awesome, what do I talk about next? Come on, brain. Yes, um, this happened. Uh, so hello, Kitty again. Um, <laughs> So for anyone who's used Luigi, this is the kind of a very flushed out version of the Luigi um, GUI screen. I just go a lot faster. Uh, so what happened here was that we were loading currency data, um, and the currency data had failed to go, failed to load that day. Now, if you're building a financial report for investors, that matters a ton, right? If you're building a daily ops report, it's like, okay, so it's, it's out by like a kind of a tiny, tiny fraction. I don't, it doesn't make any difference, right? So when you think about it in its kind of its simplest form, I'm, I'm potentially dropping a table, creating a table, and loading some data. Um, and I started to think, which of these things can go wrong? And the answer is that all of them can go wrong. Uh, you might have a trans transaction lock on the table. Uh, you might have some kind of like misconfiguration in your data structure that means you can't create it. You might be trying to load the wrong kind of data or the scheme manager, just any kind of thing. Now, so actually, when we designed this, it was also I was all thinking about the whole. When you're writing code, you try and keep your methods small, right? Small, testable, simple. Apply the same thing to my DAG. I'm going to have a lot of very small, very simple tasks. And actually, this is a bad idea. Because you cannot persist transactions across tasks, right? So I'm doing database work here. So I want to say, right, I want to create my table, uh, I'll create a new table, load some data into it, get rid of the old table by renaming it, and swap my new table into its place. If I do all of this as a single task, I can run this as a single database transaction, which means that actually I can then roll the whole thing back if it goes wrong. So for those tasks where failing once or twice in a row, I don't mind so much, I can actually do this and get away with it. Um, yeah, and then I started to read about defensive programming. But anyway, Google is my friend. So yeah, encapsulate logic in bigger chunks. Uh, cool. OK, so uh, this is um, not quite how it went down, but kind of to give you a flavor. Uh, so I, I, I started getting a lot of messages like this. The report's broken, dude. Fix it. Fix it. And I'm, the, the alarm hasn't gone off. There's nothing in the log files. Um, it looks, you know, everything. The code ran, man. It's fine. Um, yeah, apparently, we, of, of the people that came to our website, 230% bought something. <laughs> so, but it worked. <laughs> <laughs> um, we do a lot of monitoring. We use something called Datadog for monitoring, which is awesome. But you know, we, we actually we were looking at things like, what's the database load? Are we running out of memory? That kind of stuff. Um, but we actually we decided we needed to go beyond that and actually measure outcomes. So actually, we started entering these new tasks. We're actually using, uh, effectively, what we're trying to do here is we're creating integrity tests on the data itself, effectively data quality checks, right? And then we're building metrics and then posting those metrics to our monitoring service. Our metrics are really stupid simple, right? Like how many, how many rows are there in the tables, that kind of stuff. They got a bit more complicated over time. But even just doing this, we can actually start to say, like kind of the, the uh, Mark was talking about earlier, this number should be between this number and this number. But with this, we can actually start to have real-time monitoring of, so this is the difference in terms of the number of rows in our orders table between our warehouse and the production system. So as you can see, over the course of the day, uh, people buy stuff, and I'm only loading once a day. So the, the diff increases, and then drops back down when I load. And actually, you can see sometimes it goes crazy. And we can actually set thresholds on this, plug this into our alerting systems. So if it's, say, it's more than 2,000 rows out, I get a message on Slack. If it's more than 4,000 rows out, page duty goes off. We can yeah, actually stick these into our Slack channel, and this has been this has really helped us kind of keep on top of this and share the kind of workload. So monitoring and alerting on outcomes, as well as system metrics, and yeah, and use Slack. Uh, final chapter. I'm going to make it. I'm just totally going to make this. So we went global. Um, some of you may have heard. Um, when we started out, we were just kind of UK, um, and life was easy, right? So we would start selling stuff at midday, and we'd stop taking orders at 11 o'clock, which meant I got downtime. I got loads and loads of downtime to do stuff. Uh, we then started uh, doing kind of more countries in Europe, so France and Germany and some others. Uh, but you know, suddenly an hour or so shifted, so generally you've got loads of time. Then you bring in Dubai and uh, Melbourne and Sydney, and suddenly uh, there's no such thing as downtime anymore. Suddenly we need to be very resilient. 
and we need to have not, not have big overnight batch jobs that take kind of too much time. So what we were doing before was we had our nuclear option, right? If things change, drop the, drop the whole schema and reload it. So the obvious thing to do here is to stop doing that. Um, so instead, what we do is we hash the table schema. Nice thing about Postgres is you can like, read that table schema. Uh, ha hash it and then say, right, has it changed since the last hash? If yes, drop that table and only that table. Um, for everything else, just leave them. So actually, we just went from sch schema monitoring, basically, to table monitoring. And this allowed us to get rid of the nuclear option. Sorry, Ripley. Um, cool. Um, I, I was going to kind of waffle here, but I've got like three minutes left, so I'm just going to rush through this. So this is kind of from when I submitted the talk to now. We've learned some more stuff, so I'm just going to kind of really briefly go over that. Uh, when it comes to BI, old school rules still apply. Um, if you want to build like kind of you know matrix style data reporting for your company off databases, um, star schemas, <laughs> OLAP cubes, classical BI type techniques are still really really good, right? Data marts, all of this kind of stuff. Yes, I know there are people having some success running these kind of systems off things like Impala, but um, for us, really, this kind of methodology is still like is the gold standard for doing this. Configuration management is awesome. Um, we've moved towards Docker and ECS. Um, this is starting to bear fruit already. Um, this just means that you have a lot more control of how things are configured and how you deploy things and how you have reliability. And if things go wrong, you just kill the task and start again. Uh, distributed workers. Um, so we were running everything on a massive EC2 machine. This didn't scale. Um, so we've actually implemented something called Celery, which is like a distributed working worker system that's kind of backed by RabbitMQ. So actually now we kind of have the ability to effectively scale our compute um, horizontally. We're not doing like kind of, you know, we're not trying to sort terabytes of data or anything like that, but we just have thousands and thousands of jobs happening. And finally, we're moving away from uh, talking to databases and towards talking um, pretty much exclusively over our message bus on Rabbit. Um, and we're looking into uh, implementing Proto3 at the moment, which is the Google standard for effectively kind of freer schema data that you can move around on your queue. So uh, that's the end of the content. Um, final thoughts. I kind of regret nothing. Um, <laughs> it's just been a good year. Um, I've learned a lot, and uh, it's been a very educational year. I'll give it that. Um, and I think I'm really pleased that we tackled this problem the way we did, rather than, you know, rather than kind of going, oh, well, let's just buy an off-the-shelf solution from somebody or just kind of like try and you know, use a service that will do all of this kind of stuff for us. By doing this, we were in control of everything, and we could actually make sh actually improve over time and like bring all, all of it together in Python. Everything's defined in code. Um, I, I guess not many people in this room have. I used to work for um, a big consultancy company, and we dealt with a lot of kind of like very traditional kind of ETL type systems, where you kind of you know have like a GUI and like weird configuration files and stuff like that. Um, with with Luigi, everything is code. Everything's unit testable. Everything's in GitHub. Everything deploys from Travis. Super handy, and you get all the benefits of those tools. We managed to do all of this with like two people, so myself and my colleague Bertil, who's looking at his phone. Hey, buddy. Uh, and we <laughs> oh, nice. Uh, and we did. Oh, sweet man. Nice. Uh, and we did it with a tiny budget, right? This is all on AWS with like kind of an EC2 machine and an RDS database. So it was quick, it was cheap, and it was lovely. Uh, and this, this if, if you take one thing away from today, like this kind of very generic from from this presentation, it's this. All the time you spend thinking about the build process, like how do you make it fast, how do you make it reliable, how do you make it deployable, it's like the best investment of my time I've ever made. So that's, even if it can be difficult to get your boss to understand, why do you need to spend three weeks working on some engineering stuff I don't understand rather than building the report that I need? Super, super important to do this. And think about what those dependencies actually mean. So in those DAGs that I showed you, you have a bo two boxes with a line between them. What does that line actually mean? Is that like a solid line? Is that a dotted line? Does that mean have to? Does it mean usually? It means sometimes? So that, that, that interrelationship between the, the task and the DAG is super important. So just finish. Uh, something slightly different. Um, so, so at delivery, obviously, we're very interested in food. Um, and we actually deliver a lot for Nando's. And uh, some of you may have happened to remember this happened on the internet a while ago. Um, there was this whole thing on the internet about people Americans couldn't understand what we meant by a cheeky Nando's, right? Um, yeah, it, it kind of went on, and this was huge in our office. Um, and I think it's very hard to explain, so I was going to explain with a really, really simple example. Um, and that example is this. To come to a PyData conference like this, which is kind of very much you know, not promotable, kind of quite serious, very technical, and to really blatantly um, do a hiring slide at the end. Um. <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, so we're looking for data engineers in Python. Um, if you're that kind of person and want to do this kind of work, um, come grab me and Bertil afterwards, and we'll have a chat. Um, also, um, the food, the lunch today. If you didn't like that, tomorrow um, we do deliver. <laughs> <laughs> you can get five pounds off with this code. Just saying. Um, and yeah, and I'll stop now. So sleep well. Thank you.
schema change, mm. drop the database and recreate it, what happens to people that are reading that database at that point in time? So, can you repeat all the questions? Yeah, yeah, sorry. Um, so the, if, if the policy is um, to drop the database schema when, everyone's, um, when we want to reload data and the schema's changed and then reload the entire thing, what happens to people that are reading that database? Um, yeah, the, they get a connection termination. Um, and, and actually, you have to con disconnect them because otherwise you can't drop the schema. Postgres won't let you. Um, but we got away with it because we are doing it at 4 a.m. in the morning. Um, and that's well outside of hours. Uh, but, 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 but now you're moving to almost a 24-hour yeah. operation. You're going to have a problem with that, aren't you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so, yeah, sorry, it's just saying now we're 24 hours. Is that a problem? Which is why we've kind of done this. Um, so we now look at the schema of an individual table. And in, we do, what we do is in a single transaction, we try and we basically create a new table, load the data, and then flip them around at the end of the transaction. So it's only transactions that span the entire, you know, so other transactions that might span that period of time, they would then be disconnected. But that's actually very rare um, in our system. Uh, I, do I have to pick? Uh, gentleman with the beard. So, so given what I know now, would I still do the same thing again? Um, yeah, absolutely. Um, so I think in terms of the spectrum of tools you can choose to do this, um, but the really nice thing about Luigi is it's, it's really stupid simple. right? Um, it, it, the, the syntax is very simplistic. Everything comes as one piece. You do it all in one package. You can deploy it so simply. It's literally, um, you can just like take, take that code, put it on GitHub, put it on the server, and just run it. Um, I think there are definitely better tools in the open source space um, for kind of more comprehensive stuff. So you've heard about Airflow. There's things like Azkaban, uh, Azkaban and Uzi. Then you've got the corp space. You've got like, Informatica and stuff like that. But we wanted, we wanted cheap and we wanted quick, and it was perfect. Uh, guy at the back and holding his hand up the whole time. Yeah. When you drop the table, what happens to the data? You say uh, you have deleted a column. Mm. Are you reloading the data? Yeah. Yeah. So we re at the time when we were doing that, we would reload everything from source, right? Simply because this wasn't really a data warehousing project. It kind of became one by accident. Um, at the time, I just needed access to the data to build models. And like loading at the time when we started was kind of about 30 minutes. Yeah, which is why we have to drop it and reload the whole thing from the source. Yeah, but this is not this is not the production database. This is not the production base without fallover. This is not the production base production ba database backups. This is entirely independent system. Uh, uh, I don't know how to pick. Okay, there's someone looking really excited. Uh, gentleman with the glasses. Uh, what, which internal? Oh, right. So, so the question is the, the tool I was using to do our data kind of quality and integrity tests. Yeah, we just wrote that. Um, but it, it's not a complicated thing. It's, it's running SQL. Um, it's, we're actually using pandas to run SQL, storing it as a data frame, and then posting that over HTTP to Datadog. And it just store, it basically it just deals with storage of the metrics, tracking them over time, alerting, all that stuff for us. Uh, uh, long hair chap. Uh, yeah, so sure. The, the, the question is, how do you profile the pipeline, right? How do you check what's taking time, what's taking longer and longer? Um, we actually do that in two ways. Um, so we also have a task has started, post, a, post a, a notification. So we store those kind of externally. So it's task has started, task has finished, so we can track all of that. But Luigi also comes with a last time I checked, still prototype uh, history database that lets you go in there and say, what time did the task, you know, and it gives you the, for each task, you can say what, all the historics, when it ran, when did it start, when it finished. So you can, you can kind of work back to that. Oh, yeah. So the, 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 so the question is, does the Luigi history tell you which version of the task um, ran? And the answer is no. Uh, so what we do is we, we just cross-correlate between the task database and the GitHub history. So we can just look at the, the commits. Thank you. Cool. How much time? Um, what's the minutes. Minutes. Oh, I've got loads. Sweet. We can do all of these. Right. Uh, Far Corner, you've been looking for ages now. What's up?
idea to share these things. In the end, or have you also kind of like separated these out and then have dedicated to your own warehouse? Mm. So, so the question is um, th around the fact that you know I built this database for one purpose and then it became effectively the BI source for the company. Um, I think, do I, do, do I kind of, you know, was that a bad idea and what are we doing in the future with that? So I think, was it a bad idea? No, absolutely, absolutely not. Um, I think in terms of the kind of the business value that the company got out of that, um, I think in some respects, those reports were probably worth more um, because before that it was, you know, it was, it was actually, I think when I, when I first joined, if the CEO wanted to know how the company performed the previous day, the CTO wrote a SQL script and executed it. You know, that was, that was actually what was going on. Um, so I think we added a huge amount of value and freed up a lot of people's time. I think. Uh, and that, that, that kind of comes back to this whole kind of agile process. I think in the long term, the architecture sucks um, as we scale. Um, and actually, what we have done that I haven't talked about is that we've actually now moved to a Redshift warehouse that basically supports all that kind of BI stuff. Um, we're looking to put potentially some marts in, and we're doing kind of the more real time applications that are going to be running off the RabbitMQ system. Oh, any more? Oh, this is amazing. Uh, chapter one. Sure. So, with your current team, Uh, nope, nope. Lu Luigi is very vanilla about this. It ran or it didn't. The dependencies are very fixed. Um, so the way we actually deal with this is try accepts within the tasks themselves. So what we actually do is say, try this, log if it didn't happen. Sometimes we do try it. If it didn't work, try it again a certain amount of times. Um, if it doesn't work, log that it didn't work and count and start to count how many times it hasn't worked. And then alert. And so it's like if it, if it fails once, put a message in Slack. If it fails five times in a row, sound the alarm. Now, Airflow does that, though. Uh, this guy. So can you talk a bit more about how you integrate state Celery into Luigi? Ah, yes. And, um, why do you need Celery? Because Luigi would do all the data transfers. So, so the question is, um, why, are we, why have we gone down the Celery road when, when Luigi potentially could do that for us? And how far have we got with that? Um, so the, uh, does Luigi do distributed work? Sort of. I mean, if you look, if you actually look into how kind of Luigi, as I understand, and again, data scientists talking data engineering here, as I understand what it's doing is it's, Luigi is not a distributed compute system. It is a, it builds DAGs and tells and executes DAGs. What you do within the tasks is entirely up to you. So yes, there are some task templates for calling out to MapReduce, which I think is mostly how Spotify use it. We don't use MapReduce, so that's not really a lot of value to us. So actually what happened is most of our compute sits on the EC2 node in the same machine as Luigi. It's spinning up other processes, but it's all the same machine. Um, so by going, so the reason we're, we actually, <laughs> I say put it in, it's kind of, it's still on test, um, our Celery deployment, and it's on ECS at the moment, and it seems to be running okay. Um, but the beauty of that is you get kind of a very true scalability. Um, and what we're actually doing at the moment, I'll kind of fess up to this, is we are now trialing Airflow, um, because that has a lot more out of the box support for that. Um, and it will give us the ability to auto scale the cluster on AWS so that we can then start to say things like, this job must finish by 9.30. If it doesn't, auto scale the group and make it faster. Oh. Ah, gentleman in there. So, so uh, the question was, Luigi is designed for batch processing. Would you use it for kind of more real-time or kind of near real-time applications? No, not even close, mate. Um, stay a million miles away for that. Uh, if you want, if you want to do, because because it because of the kind of the, the DAG kind of concept, um, it's uh, you're, you're basically baking a lot of requirements into these things, um, and it's it's you, you end up doing a lot of hacks to try and kind of like the thing I talked about just now with like try accepts and all this kind of stuff to try and get it to flow. Um, if you want to make things um, go in real time, there are, there are much better options for that kind of thing. So message queues, for example, are one of those. Uh, so you, sir? Uh, so I understand that your main job is being run like once a day. Yeah. Do you ever run jobs in reaction to events? Uh, so the question is, we run our primary ETL once a day. Do we ever respond to specific events? Um, so we actually run once a day, once now, and once every 15 minutes now. Um, that's because we're, we're running the live report of it, uh, which I'm hoping to stop doing as soon as possible. <laughs> Uh, in terms of reaction to events, you, you could do that. We don't. Um, what we have looked at recently is AWS Lambda as a, a way of doing that kind of thing. Um, but we haven't found any, any use cases where the kind of things we're doing would be reactive enough. Um, and actually, for those kind of real-time applications, ten, what tends to happen is we build them into the Rails stack for a lot of that stuff. Cool. Any more? One last question. Uh, one last question. And there's only oh, there's two hands up. But you, you had a question, man. Uh, you had a question. Gentleman at the back. Very interesting, for example, utility 
So, so, so the, the question is, because we've baked this agility into the development process and allowing us to change schemas consistently, um, has that created a lot of problems and kind of effectively cost as we scale in terms of our kind of data warehousing and so forth? Um, the answer is that I think, like many uh, su such systems, is that at the beginning, hell yes, um, all the time. Um, as the code base has matured, we found and fixed bugs, um, the ability to deal with those schema changes has become very robust. Um, the problems we tend to be coming across now are more that we've now built something else um, on top of our kind of data pipeline, and that, and now suddenly there's something else to change. And the one thing that you can't really protect against is if someone removes a piece of business logic. So if someone decides to take out the column that says this is how much the order cost, um, all the reports that say how much we charge people are going to stop working, right? And there's, there's simply no way to do that. And to be honest, when and if that does happen, I take a lot of comfort from the fact that the alarm will go off because that is a problem. Cool. So I think that's it. Yeah, okay. Thank you very much for coming.